Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Mo Real Estate Investor. I'm Michael Album, and today with me I have Liz Faircloth, syndicator, investor, women empowerment speaker, and podcast host. And she's going to be talking to us today about all those different topics and more. So let's get right into it. Liz Faircloth, thank you so much for joining me on the show this morning. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Michael. Excited to be here. Oh, awesome. Well, I know a lot about you. I've read so much about you. And so for anyone who might not be familiar with you, I would love if you could give us a little background, who you are, where you come from, and what it is you're doing in real estate now. Sure, sure. So I uh, got my real estate start about 16 years ago uh, in my uh, 20s, a long time ago. Uh, my husband and I actually started investing together. Quick story, I was getting my degree in social work. I wanted to be a therapist. Really? And uh, my husband was an engineer. At the time, uh, get, had a job okay. in engineering, so completely different fields, and uh, we both had this shared passion for like creating a, like a bigger life than what we had th at the time. Both okay. of us came from very middle class, wonderful families, hardworking families, but you know we both had this shared passion of doing something bigger with our lives, and quite honestly, impacting a lot of people it was a value we both had at the time, Great. and still do. Anyway, um, at the same time, around the same time, my, my my brother-in-law, who was the only entrepreneur I knew, uh, you know, I didn't grow up with entrepreneurship or investing or anything like that. He handed me Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I did like personal growth books. I said, "What are you giving this to me for? I'm a, I'm going to be a therapist. I don't know why I'm reading this, but I'll read it." He's like, "You have to read it. You have to read it." Yeah. And I got really inspired by that book, like many people. I think mostly because I was learning about concepts I'd never heard of before. You know, in, in passive mm -hmm. income and creating wealth and, you know, just things you don't, you just really think about trading your time for money. That's how mm -hmm. I, you know, thought of it. And so reading that book and then changing my um, career right after that, I actually got a job in, in consulting and sales because of that book. So I didn't really, uh, and at the same time, started investing, uh, bought our first duplex after a year of study and hard work and door knocking and doors slammed in our face and going to the local <laughs> RIA meetings like everyone else. <laughs> right. uh, borrowed a, borrowed $30,000 from my father because I didn't have the money to buy the dues of duplex right outside of Philadelphia. And, um, Got that first deal under our belts in 2004, which is quite some time ago. But uh, wow. then we launched our business and started a twists and turns, ups and downs uh, path for the last 16 years. And now we are, uh, you know, we are um, mostly focused on syndication, large multifamily. Um, we uh, will have about close to 1,600 units under ownership and management in four states uh, very soon. So. Again, it was not a linear path by any means. I do <laughs> yeah. not, I, our path was just our path. A lot of twists and turns and ups and downs and tons of mistakes. But when we went all in on multi-family, uh, that was a good move for us. And at the same time as we scaled our multi-family business, I started another business uh, and community called The Real Estate Invest Her Community, which is all about empowering women to live a financially free and balanced life with my partner, Andressa. So amazing well there is so much there that i want to unpack getting back to that first duplex was that a house hack was that something that you guys lived in as a primary or was it a pure investment property that was a pure investment property it was actually uh right around the same time um at the time my boyfriend matt he bought a uh, single family row home and actually rented out two rooms so ah, he, okay. he was getting the taste. So I don't consider that my first investment because I wasn't on the deed of that. <laughs> but it's technically his because he always likes to say he house hacked on his first property. And I'm like, I'm not going to take responsibility for that because I did not buy that. <laughs> I didn't find it. I didn't do anything to contribute to that one. We just so he had had he had that after we you know when, when we already met. But yeah, he had the experience of house hacking, and, and it's a phenomenal phenomenal strategy. He actually made, I think, $30 a month when he rented out those two rooms and after the mortgage was paid. So, so that good. really gave him a lot of inspiration around, you know, obviously investing on his own, in his own way. But yeah, the duplex was not a, was not a house hack. We, um, we bought it with tenants in, in, inside and okay. learned about how to acquire multifamily and with tenants, you know, already there and that whole mix of how you manage that. But okay. yeah, it was a it was a just straight duplex. Love it. Love it. And then I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of what that nonlinear journey, as you mentioned, was because I think so many people see someone like yourself or Matt or some of these bigger names in real estate investing and think, oh my gosh, I could never do what they do because I yeah. could never get there. And so versus buying a duplex, a lot of people are really comfortable with that. So what what came next for you guys? 
yeah, a whole bunch of decisions that in hindsight, in, a, in hindsight, we're just steps on our road, if, I, if you will, or steps in the journey, totally. I like to call it. Because they, if they don't break you, they make you stronger and you learn something from them. So, you know, after that, it's funny because we started with, with a multifamily and we're focused on multifamily. But during that time frame, we got involved in so many things were not, that were not multifamily. So we, we decided to really focus on uh, buying in uh, Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. We lived, uh, we lived close to Trenton. We lived in a little town in New Jersey and said, we really want to focus locally. So our goal was 30 mile radius. And so we said, okay, what area are around us can we afford? Number one, and number two, could we really make a difference? Because I came from social work. That's right. that, that is my background. That's my values. I I want to, and 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 I had that shared passion with my husband. So our mantra at that time was to transform urban environments. That okay. was our you know transform lives through through real estate and, and and really focused on on cities, urban urban you know densely populated areas. So Trenton met the met the met the you know goal there. So we started buying in that in that city, and we. You know, we started buying small multis. We started buying mixed use. Uh, then we bought a commercial building, okay, which did not have any residential tenants. It was a ten thousand square foot commercial building. Was it like an office complete, or a warehouse? Or? Yeah, it was an office building. Okay, okay. And and you know, when you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and we were we were in our twenties. I don't want to say that everyone in their twenties doesn't make they may all make mistakes, but we were pretty naive. You know, we didn't know. I we was didn't right know. there we with didn't you. Have mentors. Yeah. You know, we didn't have the community that we're that I'm building now. I mean, I wish we had a mentor or, or had a little more um, focus. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we bought, we, we looked at this building and we just ran the cash flow and said, okay, by square foot, what can we make? And it was like a killer deal on paper, right? It was like this absolutely amazing, like, we'll be out of the, we'll be, you know, done. And I was still working. He had quit his job at the time we got married and I was doing the sales and consulting job. So anyway, we ran the numbers. Everything looked amazing. We bought, bought the building. Uh, we used a um, two lines of credit. Okay. My mother-in-law's house. We we got a line of credit on their home. Now this is pre the crash, right, so right. You know anyone? They're you know, giving out money. Did. <laughs> yeah, they're just literally just. So you want a line of credit, Gary? We give you like ninety percent loan to value. We right. had like zero experience in what we were doing. <laughs> I mean, in hindsight, I'm like, wow, that was. I don't know if, if I was the bank, I would have done it. But hey, you know, you take money where you can get it when you start out. Right. And we did it legally, of course. But, you know, in hindsight, they're not writing those loans anymore. <laughs> but um, this is 2005. And hey, you know, they did what they did. So we bought the building and took two lines of credit out. And it was a half a million dollars. Okay. And, you know, that was, a, um, that was one of those projects that we had to learn by making mistakes. We started rent. No, it was a little later than 2005. I want to say... It was right before the crash. <laughs> a great okay. time to buy right. commercial building. And um, long story short, we ended up, we couldn't find a tenant. So when you do your market analysis and say, okay, who's going to rent this asset, right? Mm -hmm. Like we do now, we thought one tenant, one business, but we didn't actually analyze in a, in a, how many businesses are going to rent a 10,000 square foot building in downtown Trenton. It's, it's not like a hundred, it's probably on a hand, you know, in a handful. So we yeah. couldn't find a tenant. Here we have a vacant building, and that's not good for us uh, buy and hold investors, right? You know, right. tenants paying you. So obviously, that's your customer. So, long story short, we ended up breaking it up into small offices. Okay. And and that's what the vision of that building is to to date. Still, we actually have it under contract. We're selling that building. We've had it for since two thousand and, and yeah seven. So it's been a long time. We've had that building, and it's always been a small office. About you know eighteen to twenty users have been in that building. So. So you got tenants. Why? We do. We did got tenants. We, we got them and awesome. learned through that process. And then we flipped property. We bought, you know, we, we flipped by a, a couple dozen properties over the years. Um, so learn that side of the business. But yeah, I mean, we, so we got involved in a few different niches, which most people don't, they focus, right? They're told to focus. Yeah. So, uh, but again, it all adds to our, our, our journey. And, and it also adds to why we said, okay, 2010, let's really go all in on multifamily. And that really helped really, really helped us propel us much faster than the first five years uh, into growth. Okay. And what about multifamily is so attractive to you and, and really made you make that decision in 2010? Because I think a lot of people would agree that, yes, multifamily is this great asset class. But if you ask them why, they say, well, because that's what everyone's talking about. So what, you right. know, what, are, what are kind of the nuts and bolts that, that got you excited about multifamily? Well, you know, it's funny because you start to look at, and I think I, I, I encourage a lot of the, the women that in our community that, that I'm talking to all the time is 
people often say, oh, I want to get involved in this niche or that niche, just like you're saying. Yet they need to look at where they've had some successes. You know, and that could be in real estate or that could be in life. Because sometimes they go in, people go into this with, with no real estate investing experience, but they've had success somewhere. Mm. And there's, there's little nuggets in that success, in my belief, that could be used in this business. So what I mean by that, specifically for us, is we looked at everything. We looked at our whole portfolio. We had multifamily. We had flips going on. We had this commercial building where we were like, Small office, you know, uh, landlords. Yeah. Uh, we had a raw land deal that we were doing. I mean, we were kind of like involved in a lot of different things. Yeah. And we looked at the numbers and said, okay, where have we had success? What is forgiving in this business? And quite honestly, multi, and we even had single family. We had a bunch of single family rentals as well. And in our experience, multifamily is one of the most forgiving investments. What do you mean by that? Yeah. What do I mean by that? For us, we started to say, okay, what, where have we had success? And then multifamilies have been forgiving. So we bought one of our first purchases in New Jersey. And outside of, of, of Trenton was, were about three, four units. So we bought three, four units pretty, pretty quickly into when, we, when we moved into you know, building our business. And we bought them too high. Okay. We spent too much money on them. So it wasn't like this home run deal. It wasn't like this. Quite honestly, our first duplex <laughs> was probably one of the best deals we did really? early on. Yeah, and then the four, the three, four units were just we paid too much for them, and we okay. didn't properly look at capital expenditures. There are older buildings, Class C buildings, Class C, and you know, uh, um, community. Mm -hmm. So you're you're managing a whole business when you're when you're you know in those in a situation where you're figuring out what is the market need. Okay, How, who the, who am I going to be serving in terms of tenants? This building needs so much, right? Yeah, yeah. So my point in saying that is even though these were not home runs for us, and even though we weren't making the cash flow we had intended to, we said if we had made these tweaks and if we had bought these properties at this amount, we would be, you know, absolutely. And then so we learned we learned a lot from those first few fourplexes. Then we started to do the Burr strategy in Trenton, where we bought two single family homes and bought them at, at, at the right price, put, you know, added value in a sense. And, and then obviously refinanced them, pulled the cash out, did it over again. And we started doing that really successfully. And we were making cash flow. We pulled the money out. And, and it was like, okay, win, win, win. You know, it was all the wins that we all want in this business. Yeah. We didn't have them in certain ways, and other, but we learned from our, our challenges. So we then had those successes. And, as, and when I say they're forgiving, you know, if you have a bad month in a multifamily property, right? The roof needs to be replaced. That's a big. That's a big one. That's a bad a small month. One. Yeah. yeah, that's a bad <laughs> month. But you know, so yes, those that that wonderful cash flow may not be there that that month, but you're adding value to the property, right? So so the, so over time, you're in the long game. Multifamily is a long game. This is not a flip. This is not an overnight success. So we knew that, and you know, we have a tenant move out, and you have to you have to you know you have to dip into this or your reserves to do this. But then the next six months are really strong. They're forgiving in the sense that it's, it's one month is not going to, now, multiple months, and I'm going to kill you, but they're forgiving. I mean, in a flip, you know, you make a couple mistakes, that's going to cost you the project. The whole like, deal. it's not yeah. as forgiving, in my sense, or in my opinion. Um, getting into a niche, I don't think it's forgiving. You're learning a whole new business. So, you know, the time and money are, are not going to be on your side when you're, when you're entering something new. Yeah. So, for us to go in to go all in on the, the niche that we knew and that we did have some, we did have success with, that made sense to us. I love that. I love that. And just out of curiosity, Liz, how much, by how much did you overpay either in dollars or percentages? Because everyone's heard you make money when you buy. And so I think, especially in today's market, people are so, you know, a little bit gun shy of, well, the prices are sky high and I have to yeah. make money when I buy. But you're kind of living, breathing, walking example of, yeah, you make money when you buy, but you can also make some mistakes and live to talk about it. So how much did you ever- And we sold, yeah, and it's funny because we sold those properties. We sold those properties in 2013 when I had my son. No, I had my son. So it was 2014. Okay. We, we, um, everything is in years of my children. That's how I remember <laughs> things. But um, we held those buildings for about six or seven years. Okay. So yeah, we, I would say we overspent fourplex in different areas is going to cost different amount of money. I want to say we, we paid two- 90 per for each, each fourplex, fourplex. Okay. per per fourplex which is 
which is not crazy for New Jersey. Uh, however, in hindsight, with the capital expenditures and the deferred maintenance and all the things the seller does not tell you. <laughs> they don't volunteer. You, there's a reason they're selling. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if it's a duplex. I don't care if it's a 400 unit apartment complex. There's always a reason. They are deferring something. And you discover that when you own it, when you own the property. You just hope it's not, you know, more than you could, you know, uh, conservatively underwritten right. for. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I would say we probably overpaid at least thirty or 40000 per, per property. property, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I'd say it was pretty okay. high because there were some serious things wrong. Maybe not that high, probably twenty to 30000 but that's still pretty. Now, in hindsight, again, even if you overpay, it's a long-term hold. So every month, what are we doing? We're paying off that, we're paying our mortgage, which is paying off the property. So by the time we actually sold, now, and interesting enough with that, that street, we bought those three, four units, and we, when we sold, we, we had bought two more buildings. Okay. So we actually sold five properties, all as a portfolio. And I always recommend that to people, is that if you can really focus on an area and start to think, even if it's not a 20-unit apartment building, that's very um, enticing to people, to buy 20 units on one mm -hmm. street, because you're leveraging time and resources and energy, obviously, versus 20 units in different parts of the state or different parts of the country, in my yeah. opinion. So um, that was a good move in, the, in those, I would say, for, for us. But yeah, and, and, and then when we sold it, we, we, we sold it and we actually did make, we did make money. Because you didn't, you're, again, you're p paying off the loan and, and seven years later, and the line of credit that I told you about that we used, one of the parents' lines of credit, with that sale, we paid off that line of credit. So Great. It all worked out. Great. No, I love that. I love it. And it's like real life monopoly, you know, buying up the whole block and then, and then selling it. And yeah. so you bring up a really good point because I'm a, I'm a very big believer in the portfolio kind of theory as well in consolidation versus diversification. Mm -hmm. But what would you recommend or say to people that think, well, what if something happens to that one city? I, I want to diversify and really spread out the risk, not put all my eggs in one basket. Yeah, I, I, would, agree, I would say that that's a, that's a, you could think in that way. And I think that's a fine strategy. You know, that, I wouldn't disagree with that opinion. And I agree with it in some ways in that. Like for us, we were all in on in New Jersey. We were all in in Trenton, New Jersey, and um, you know between different things that happened in the city, things that were going to be happening, we saw a really up and coming city, and we saw something we can make a difference. And you know, a decade later, we saw some of the same things. So you know, you I always say you cannot control a market; you can only participate in one. And mm. you need, and we didn't know that at the time. We thought we could yeah. make you know this enormous difference. And we did in what we did. I wouldn't say we didn't make a difference. But my point in saying that, though, is that we at that time, we said we needed to start diversifying in different markets. Let's keep, you know, and we still have we still have properties and projects. We have a new development we're doing in Trenton still. So we're still active investors in the city. Oh, cool. But we started to diversify in other markets. Okay. And so then we moved to Pennsylvania and said, okay, not that, that's not far from New Jersey, but we bought a building in Philadelphia, which was, you know, 30 minutes still. And then we... Built, bought, bought another building we still have in, in the Lancaster area. We have been very focused on finding more in that area, but it's just, there's no large multifamily in the Lancaster. We have a 49 unit, which is wonderful. Great building, class B, like just a really strong, strong property. But, you know, those, we, we just, last year we bought two more, we bought another 40 unit and a 30 unit. So that's the type of size buildings they have in that area. We're okay. larger, we have also larger assets. So we said, okay, let's keep buying there, but we can't that's not going to do it. We can't just, just focus on that one market. But we have bought more recently there. So then we, we moved to North Carolina and Kentucky. So we're only in two markets there. We're in Winston-Salem. We're in Lexington. So right now we have three focused cities, Lancaster, Lexington, and, um, and, and Winston-Salem, all of which, like our recent project that we're, we're raising, raising for, and we're almost at closing to here, which is a 670-unit portfolio, Two of the buildings in North Carolina and Winston-Salem, and three of them are in Lexington. La the, the, the fund that we did before, one was in Lexington, one was in Lancaster. So, you know, everything we're buying are in the tr our tried and true markets, which are three. Okay. You know, uh, if someone said, I got this amazing deal in Atlanta, Georgia, or in Austin, Texas, it's not that expensive. And, you know, of course, Austin, Texas is like crazy expensive. <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, we get pitched on different areas all the time. We say no. And it have to be something very significant. And I'm saying we're never going to go into another market. But it has to be a really good reason. We've built relationships in these three markets, our property management companies. 
there's just a, a um, an ease once you start to build that. But only you can kind of determine, is it three markets? Is it two? Um, but I, I, you know, it, it was interesting to see when COVID hit too, which markets, how they mm-hmm. all kind of fared, um, in which buildings did. Our properties in Trenton actually we had the most trouble with, but we were the buildings we were having trouble with before COVID. We continued to. It was not a like oh, it was not this a, change. a surprise. No, it wasn't yeah, really that yeah. big of a change. And if anything, some of our buildings thrived. Most of them thrived more during COVID because we we built we were in um, workforce housing. We we provide th- these are not Class A apartment complexes. These are workforce housing. I always like to say affordable living for people. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes total sense. And Liz, I'm curious to know what's it like now being on the syndication side of the business, having come from the direct ownership side. So, so yeah, I mean, in terms of our, our the way we we scaled into syndication, we were buying everything ourselves. Okay. Or, you know, through lines of credit or just getting creative. Um, and then we started to partner with people. And our first private, like, money partners were we would – we went in 50-50 with, with one or two people, bought a couple properties. Both had active roles, which is important. Okay. Uh, you got to read – give a shameless plug for my husband's book, Raising Private Capital. But people totally. buy – People buy properties all the wrong ways and they – who's active, who's, who's passive, that's really important um, because if you are bringing in a passive investor and they're – they're not truly passive and you're not syndicating, that's a problem technically from with the SEC. So we started mm. to work with active investors. Um, and then it got to the point where that, that was two single family homes. They had a role, we had a role. And then we had our eyes on a 15 unit um, portfolio. It was a 10 unit in New Jersey and it was like a, um, a fourplex in Trenton. And that was uh, one of our first syndications, was, which was we called DeRosa Capital Four. We actually okay. just sold that. We're up to 15. So um, anyway, Ooh, but that was four. Nice. And um, and yeah, we had raised about $500,000 to, to do that. Okay. And it just made sense. So so our ownership went from 100% to 50% to general partners as the, as the folks kind of syndicating and putting everything together it tends to be about 30%. I mean, there's different models, but that's the model we've had. So your limited partners, right? The folks that are passively investing along with you in the syndication own 70%. Okay. control none of it, right? So you remember that. <laughs> so there's, a, there's an ownership, there's a, there's a, th- those two things are different because um, they're limited, right? And they're truly passive. Right. So, um, you know, for us, we started to really go all in and raising money and working with other people. Um, so the scalability of our business became important. There's other people that can own 50 doors or 10 doors and be financially free, right? Because they own it 100%. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of like building the business that works for you. More units doesn't mean you're making more money. I will say that. And, and this is someone who, who that's been our business model is buying larger assets. It's just the model we've chosen. And it's the, it's the train we've chosen. And, and there's a lot of benefits to, I mean, one of the things I love about what we do versus if it was just me and my husband um, is I, I really love creating win-wins with people. And while you're making money, you're making the investor money. And, and these are like everyday people, you know, and, and these are folks that have 50,000 in their self-directed IRA or they have this. So it's, it's, these are just regular people looking to create a legacy for their families. Um, yeah. We have close to 300 investors we work with now. And it's just neat to like oh, be building our wealth and we're building theirs and we're, you know, really creating that. That's that's the neat part about syndicating something, right? You're just buying larger assets more with other with other people and winning together. Uh, but yeah, it's a whole process. And, you know, in terms of legal to teams, that GP side tends to can, can also decrease as you bring more people on, right? Because now we have a partner that focuses on acquisition. We were doing everything. And now we have a very, we have a very solid team, but a larger team. So you have to be okay with maybe not taking the full share of your your GP side and maybe taking less to give up ownership to someone else. Lots of different models, but that's yeah. been the model we've chosen. So we can focus on what we're good at and 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 build with other people. Uh, other other folks are are they're like I don't want to give any of the ownership up. Well, you know, and that's okay. Different it's, model. It's, yeah, it's their model. And I think it's quite honestly much simpler and easier when I hear people. Like, I got thirty units and I'm just good to go. I'm like. Okay, that's awesome. You know, like that's what you've chosen. That's that's wonderful. We're not we're not our doors. You know, no one's defined by how many doors someone has. Who cares about that as much as what's your lifestyle? You know, what what's the return you're looking for and are what's you living life you? on your own terms? Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. Do you know um Chris Voss? He wrote yes. Never Split the Difference. Mm-hmm. 
he talks in that book about how as a negotiator or just in life, you should look for win-win scenarios. It doesn't have to be this win-lose, me getting over you, me getting the lower end of the stick, right? So I love that you talk about win-win and when you win, your investors win and vice versa. That's so great. Um, Liz, I'm curious, as people start to get more experience under their belt and do more deals, one of the things I so often hear is I'm running out of money. Where do I go find more money? And so what should people be aware of, be thinking about, be cognizant of if they do want to start bringing in partners, uh, money partners, capital partners? Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, that's really how we were able to to scale our business. And it's also how we were able to do a lot of flips. So different types of money is used for different types of projects. Okay. Really simply put, you have debt and you have equity. Debt is a private lender, somebody literally lending you money for an agreed upon interest rate and you know more short-term projects. So they're gonna, their, their expectation is they're gonna get that money back, right? Six months to 12 months. Okay. Uh, the, longer, the longer you have their money, the more interest you're paying. You win and if you lose, they still win, right? So it's not a win-win, I mean, it's a win-win in, in the uh, theoretical sense. But I mean, in terms of your profit and your deal, I mean, there's been flips. Uh, depending on the, the partner we've had, that we've had to bring money to closing. Not a lot, but that that's terrible, right? Who wants to bring that money? That doesn't feel to good. A pro- it doesn't feel good, right? Thank God it didn't happen often. But I remember this one project. We made our our lender was made whole, but we had to take a hit as the owner. So that's one thing. You have to be mindful of the project you're getting into. These lenders, especially in the debt side, they're lending you money. That that's a and that's the agreed upon, regardless of how well you do. So you must conservatively underwrite and manage with, with debt investors, with private lenders. The Managing the project timeline is critical in the budget because a six-month project that goes to a 12-month project that goes to a two-year project, the interest will kill you and you'll, that you owe that to that person, right? And there's yep, ways to yep. legally um, set that person up for success with a, with a promissory note and other things that, you know, it's, that's the benefit, right, of, of a private lender. Uh, is that they're protecting themselves with with real estate typically, so um, that's the one strategy. That's that and and that, and you pay them back in essence. Think of that as like when you buy, it's like a classic burr. You're buying it, you're renovating it, you're refinancing it. That's how you're able, Paying or you're that. selling it, right? It's an exit strategy. Okay. You're either refinancing or selling to pay back that lender. I hear so many, I see, see a lot of questions with women in our community about, oh, this person wants to lend me a hundred thousand and. It's a seven-year project. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not, you know, like, <laughs> we don't have any lenders in our syndication. No one's lending us money. Now these are equity partners. So really think okay. of it like short-term projects, there's a beginning, middle, and end, whether the, the end is a refinance or a, a, a sell is really useful for private lenders, for debt, okay. St- that strategy. Um, there's no tax advantages for the lenders, but in essence, they're, they're getting usually a higher interest rate. You know, you can, you can, get, you can get up to 12%. You know, we have a HELOC on our house right now, and we're paying 3% on our HELOC. We're lending that out. Yeah. We're a private lender to someone else's project. 12%, 3%, we're, we're gaining 9%. That's You're good, arbitraging. Good stuff, right? How do I do more of that? I love it. I <laughs> love it. How do I do more of that? But anyway, that's, that's we're doing that, but lenders were doing we're, 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 we're that for us too. So it's a two-way street. On the equity side, that's really where we focus most of our business from a multifamily perspective. So remember early on, you don't have to syndicate or use private money and syndicate and, and get all complex on your first on your first private money deal. I, I would highly recommend you don't do that. But the okay. key is to have two active partners. So the deal that we, the project that we work with was one of our first non-family members was a gentleman I actually met in college and uh, met in grad school, excuse me. And we were meeting together and he, he said something. I want to say this because I think it will help your listeners. He said something very interesting. He said, I love real, he's a financial planner. It's like, I love to okay. invest in real estate, but I just don't have the time. And yeah. that is like a great thing for someone who wants to invest, doesn't have the time. Meanwhile, me and my husband, that's all we had. Cause I'd quit my job at that point. <laughs> we had plenty of time. <laughs> so time is not a problem for us, uh, but money, right? We, we were tapped out financially. So we brought our, you know, and again, he had an active role. He audited the books. He personally guaranteed he was a, he had a great W-2 job at the time. We didn't, we didn't have enough assets even. So, you know, with banks, right, we weren't as even bankable. Not that we weren't at all, but, you know, people who don't have jobs who are investors full-time, who don't have a lot of assets in there, you know, to, to, to call upon, 
uh, Banks like, hold on, hold on, what's the story here? So, <laughs> so we he personally guaranteed the loan. We went in 50-50. He had a role. We had a role. We we managed the project. We 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 managed the con- contractor. Ref- uh, got the tenants, in, you know, secured tenants. Refi- you know, we were able to refinance, and then pull that his fifty thousand out, and then do it over again and continue to make cash flow. So I say that because we did those type of projects prior to syndicating and to really pull money together. Um, I mean, raising money is active or passive. It, you just have to be clear on the structure and make sure you're doing it in the right way, with, in the right legal way. But yeah, I think I think working with other people and structuring it in a way that is a win-win for everyone is critical. Now, he didn't come in as a lender. He came in as an equity partner. So that means that you are you are 55% uh, owner of that, of that property and of that LLC together. And so what brings along with that, I mean, in a lender situation, it's easier, right? They're lending you money. They're not a partner of yours. This is not a long-term marriage. They're not making decisions with you, yeah. You know, but with, a, with an equity partner, it's a different game. You know, so, so what comes along with one end, end of the stick on money, especially in that situation, because we are 50-50 partners, uh, and, and you have to be really clear on what everyone's bringing to the table. How are you guys going to communicate? Uh, so everyone's clear on expectations. What if one of us gets hit by a bus? What happens? So laying all that out and operate, it's more complex, not complex. Yeah. In a, you know, don't don't Google an operating agreement. We did that with one of our earlier partners. And that was a disaster. We just used some boiler tape operating agreement. That Don't do that. We did that <laughs> early on and that was a really p- bad mistake. But so my point though is that's how we've grown our business. Other people do it through owner financing or seller financing. There's so many creative ways to get into projects but for us, you know, working with on the lent, with debt and equity were the two strategies that we focused on as we as we grew our business. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And it's some it's funny. Someone once told me that your operating agreement with a business partner is kind of like a prenup. And so, would you go get a boilerplate plate prenup from you know Google? Of course you would. Sp- spend the money, do it right. It's going to save you in the long run. I absolutely will. I cannot say that enough. It- <laughs> Do not get a bother pay agreement. Please don't do that. Great, great tip. Well, Liz, I want to shift gears here and talk about the amazing community and podcast that you've created and host, The Real Estate Invest Her Show. Talk to us a little bit about that. What is it? Who is it for? How can people get involved? Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, as I as we started to partner with with different people, because that's just been a strategy that my husband and I had, we wanted to start flipping properties in Philadelphia, and okay. uh, on Bigger Pockets, which which we're very grateful for Bigger Pockets, because that's really how me and Andres actually met. Um, oh, really? I, yeah, I saw her flipping properties in Philadelphia, and I said, "That's neat." It's about seven years ago, and I said, "We need to we need to meet." I just got into a conversation and, and said, "I'd love to come by at some point. We can connect." So. You know, we got together uh, on a Sunday afternoon. And you know when you meet people, you know when you meet people, you're like, this is like, this is, we're talking about a lot of different things here. Like, this is a deep person. Like, we just connected. Yeah. We were, we just became instant friends, uh, me Love and her. And, and then we started really just supporting each other and helping each other however we could, just like friends do. And then a project came up. We started flipping. We started to do one project together. And then we started to, uh, we actually started a women's mastermind at the same time for free. Oh, cool. um, so we always had this shared passion of of connecting. We didn't know it, but we had this shared passion of supporting women in this business. So long story short, we did a handful of projects together, and we would be talking about those projects. So we'd get together for coffee, what's working, what's not, who are we going to hire as a realtor for this project, all those sort of things that came up. And um, one day, in, a, in like a Panera Bread, we are just like, where are the women in this business? You know, like we didn't know a lot of women in, in, in this space. and. Mm-hmm. We started to Google it and we said, wouldn't it be great to like help women that are up and coming, but also get support of things that we're working on? Because everyone, everyone's somewhere on their journey. Yeah. No one's done, you know, and everyone has something to give, have something to get. So we said, um, and for different reasons, we saw it as like women, women have such a an advantage in this business. But for whatever reason, you go to these RIA meetings, you go to these conferences. Women, women were never keynoting at the conferences we were going to. They were, mm. they were like maybe like a handful of them at the RIA meetings. We're like, there's got to be more women. So we start with our podcast. We said, we're going we're gonna to change some things up here. I was told early on, we said, we're going to interview just women, only women. And I know that's done now, but at the time, it was four years ago. Actually, it was kind of unique to think to do that. Yeah. And so um, people told us that we would run out of women. They're like, there's a lot of, there's not that many investors. I said, I don't know if we're going to have wow. a problem. 
So, I mean, we were told that. This wasn't like 1955. Right. This was four years ago. I mean, <laughs> yes. literally four. And this is like like a friend of mine, a, a gentleman. A woman didn't say that to me, but a gentleman said that to me. And he, so anyway, um, we started it with, with, the, with the mission. We've always been very mission-centric and very community-centric. Um, with the with the with the goal of empowering women to live a financially free and balanced life, you know, balance is a made up term. You can't be balanced by itself, right? Because if you're focused on one thing, you're you're in you're not balanced, right? Right. We we right. know that. But I'll, I'll say our and women, we have um, we have young kids. At the time we had younger kids. Women have so many hats they wear, so it's very easy to get overwhelmed, just like anyone, right? But we just know because we're women, we can only speak from our own experiences. So we said, wow, wouldn't it be great to create a community that not only lifts each other up, helps helps one another create generational wealth, you know, on your own terms, but yeah. does it in a way that we're not killing ourselves doing it. Because her and I are both very hardworking. A lot of the women in our community are. And sometimes you'll do that at a detriment of your own health, uh, your own self-care. So we have three mm-hmm. pillars in our community. So everything we do from our conference to our meetups to our podcast, we always focus on three pillars, which is real estate investing, business and self-care. And so we always create content around those three pieces. And, um, you know, we hold that pretty true because we don't, you know, we we don't want women to just focus on the investing side and forget themselves. And that's what happens a lot. Or we focus on one thing and everything else goes, goes away. So, so that was, we started the podcast and then slowly moved into like a Facebook community. We have over 10,000 women now on that group where they're supporting each other. We have over 55 meetups across the country of two in Canada. Wow. And uh, and we have a a membership. Women started to ask us for accountability and mentorship. And we're like, okay, what would we create that we would want it when, you know, as we were growing our portfolios. So that's what we've created in our Stride membership, which is a a paid membership. We have close to about a hundred women in in that, in that community. So um, so it's neat. You know, we've really evolved to continually ask, like, whatever we do, it's like, is this going to serve the women we're, we're serving? Our community serves all women from new to experienced. Uh, our Stride membership tends to be a little more more of an experienced woman who, who we're focused on. And when I say experienced, they can have five to 10 deals. They don't have to have, like, you know, 1,400 units under their belt. But yeah. it's, you know, having some experience. But our community and our meetups uh, has always been for everyone, you know. And we really want to serve all women on their journey. Amazing. So. And so where can people learn more, can join, can get involved? Yeah, absolutely. And and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll share real quick. We are, we're actually having our inaugural uh, in-person uh, investor con in June. So June 23rd, Ooh. June 24th, we're really excited. It's going to be a two-day event in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Westin. And uh, it's going to be more than just like a traditional conference, but more of like a transformational experience. Uh, Kim Kiyosaki is going to be our keynote. So we're really excited about it. Uh, It's going to be just different than any event. We really thought about women and what they need and created a, you know, an event to, to do that. So you can learn all about it. Us and our podcast at our, our website's probably the best way to get a hold of us. The real estate invest her, H E R.com. Love it. Love it. Liz, this has been so much fun, really insightful. I want to thank you so much for your time. If people have questions for you directly, maybe about the DeRosa Group or more about your story, where should they go to, to, to learn or get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, we're really, we're really active in our um, on Instagram too. So you can follow us at, at the Real Estate Investor. Uh, DeRosa Group, yeah, our website's the is derosagroup.com. Um, you know, the info at, I think it's either, either or website, you know, could will always get to me. Um, and you know, happy to happy to help any way I can. But we do a lot of free content. My husband does a lot of free content on the Derosa side. I do a lot of free content on the investor side. So constantly trying to uh, help add value. Amazing, a power couple. Thank you so much for coming on, Liz. This was really fun. I'm sure we'll chat soon. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you got to take care. Okay, everyone, that was our episode. A big, 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 big thank you to Liz. That was really insightful. Tons of great nuggets in there. So definitely give it a second listen if uh, you weren't paying attention the first time. As always, we'd love to hear from you. So comments, ratings, reviews are super helpful for us. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Happy investing.